chapter number 5 um, is where we'll be today. Matthew chapter number 5, if you have your Bible. Um, I'm not a long-winded guy. Y'all usually go till 12, 11.45. They're, they're laughing, so the answer to that might be 12.15, 12.30. <laughs> now I'm getting warmer. Keep going to 12.45. I'm too hungry for that. So 11.30, I, I got maybe 11.50, 11.55 max. Uh, whenever I first started preaching, I would our pastor, he's like, he, he'll go 45 minutes to an hour, and that's just uh, it's what he does every service. And he'd get me up. I remember the first time he was gone out of town, he said, Jake, you're preaching this morning. And I was like, you don't understand. I only preach to, to young people. I don't preach to, to old people. They're, they don't respond. I like young people. And, and he said, oh, okay, great. I'm going out of town. You're preaching this morning. And I was like, but you, I just said I'm not, I don't do that. And so I remember preaching on a Sunday morning. And we usually get out 12, 15, 12, 20. I was done with everything at like 11:43, And I was like, oh, because when the pastor's gone, like, everything just goes faster. There's not, like, all the pre-stuff. Like, I got up to preach at, like, 11.13, and I was, like, I, I was adding stuff to my sermon on the fly, repeating stuff, reiterating stuff, and it still was, like, 11.43. And I learned right then that there's no such thing as a bad short sermon. And everyone came up to me, that was an amazing sermon. I was like, whatever, you just got to, to Golden Corral before everyone else did. That's the only reason why you liked it. But Matthew chapter number 5 In verse number 14, it says this, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This month, obviously, he said you're starting off a missions emphasis month. And I want to preach to you this morning on the subject, How Bright Is Your Light? Missions always starts individually, personally. This church can't have a a, a light to reach the world if you don't have a light. This church can't grow if if you don't grow. And so personalized this morning, I want you to ask yourself personally this question. How bright is my light? Like myself, not how bright is the pastor or the sound guys. or No, how bright is, is my light? And if we do that, I feel like we can get some help from God. Let's pray, and then we'll get right into it. Dear God, thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. God, thank you for um, just being so good. Like that song we just say, or that was just sung said. And I pray that you would help us to realize that we should live a life that's glorifying to you because of how good you've been to us and because of our love for you. We love you, and thank you for for everything you've done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And right here in Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 14, um, it it says, Ye are the light of the the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. But that first word, ye, each and every one of us has a light, whether we want it or not. And I remember five, a little over five years ago, we built a house right there in Malvern, Arkansas. And we were building, they had an electrician that was was there. And construction is not known for being like the most clean environment, like most of those guys, they don't have uh, mouths that are really pleasing to the Lord, and this one guy was the same way, and he had one of the worst mouths I've ever heard. I worked at FedEx Freight for years, and this guy could could speak them with the best of it, and I I, I was there, and I thought, man, this is my house. It's not built yet, but I'm going to ask this guy to stop talking like this, and so I remember I pulled up in the the yard one day, and he was sitting out on the porch, and he's in his 70s, so I thought I'm going to have to do this, and I'm going to have to be respectful. Um, but I just don't want him talking like this at the, the house all the time. And, and I remember I walked up to the porch and I said, uh, or, or before I even got up there, he said, Jake, what do you do for a living? And I thought, this is a great opportunity. And he, I, I said, well, I'm a youth pastor at Gospel Light Baptist Church. And before I could say anything else, he said, brother. And I thought, I only have one brother. What you, what's this guy talking about? He said, brother, I've been a deacon at such and such Baptist church in Arkadelphia for 35 years. And immediately I thought, awesome, I want to come check your church out. Where's this church at? No. The truth of the matter is this. I didn't want to have anything to do with with that church because of the light that he was shedding, the testimony that he had on the workplace was not glorifying to God. And honestly, it's sad because he had a 22, 23-year-old kid that was working for him. I don't know if that kid was saved or not, but if he wasn't, I don't think he would want what that guy had. And, and if what we have 
looks like it's killing us, why is someone else going to want to have it? I, I'm sick and tired of Christians being down in the dumps about everything in life. And you see it on Facebook, it's just constant scrolling through, uh, complaining and all this stuff. Hey, as, as Christians, we have something to live for. I don't know about the lost out there that have no hope, that have no direction in life, that don't know where they're going. But I know last week, we, we, I'm sure you celebrated here, we celebrated at Malvern. Our God is alive and well, and we have hope because one day I'm going to see my grandma in heaven. I'm going to see my grandpa in heaven, and I'm going to be there, and you will too. But the truth of the matter is we live our lives on this earth like we have no hope, always complaining, always fighting, always judging. But listen, if what you have looks like it's killing you, no one else is going to want it. But we can find some, some interesting things on this light. Number one, look at the power. Of the light. Verse number 14 says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. When someone as big as the Lord moves inside of us, we should not be able to hide that. There should be a difference in you and the guy up the street. There should have been a difference in that deacon if he was saved and on his way to heaven than that co-worker who was lost. Because when God is in our lives, there should be a difference. You say, well, I don't, I don't like that. Well, that, that's fine. You don't have to like it, but it's the truth. God, when, whenever he saved me, he changed me. And I can't do the things I used to. I can't. You say, why? Because when I try, if I ever try, the Holy Spirit convicts me and I'm, I feel horrible about myself. And if you don't have that inside of you, you might want to evaluate yourself and say, am I really saved? Because when God is in our lives, hey, in John 1, 5, it says, in the light... And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John 8, 12 says this. Then, Jesus, uh, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. When Jesus comes inside my life, I should be different. I should have a light. Those coworkers should say, hey, man, there's something different about him. But we all know those people who claim to be Christians, who might even go to church on Sunday. But they're no different than the rest of the people that you work with. The convicting thing is, though, sometimes that's me. And sometimes that's you. I wonder, and we talked about it a little bit in Sunday school, I wonder if there's any evidence in your life that you're a Christian. That's, that's, that's hard. But not only the power of the light, Look at the hiding of the light. In verse number 15, it says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Hey, I wonder what bushels we have in our life. What, what's hindering your light? Is it your, is it your speech? Is it maybe gossip? Is it complaint? Is it indifference? You just don't really care. Uh, I'm here at church this morning, but I just want to kind of live my life. I've always wondered how um, whenever it comes to being a Christian we're always okay with being average. Think about that. Any of you ever play sports or, or whatever? You, you didn't, you weren't okay with okay I just want to make the team and sit on the bench the whole time. I never want to get in the game. No, no one ever wants to do that. In the workplace you're never like alright I never want to get promoted. I never want to make more money. I just want to be that low level guy and be a lifer and stay there. But, but listen in the Christian life a lot of times we're just like I'm content. I'm good. I don't, I don't need to do any more for God. I'm fine right where I'm at. <laughs> don't bother me. Yeah. Don't mess with me. I'm good. Uh, and listen, on the bench. But we said a, a little bit earlier, we don't know when the Lord's coming back. And when he comes back, there, there should be something inside of us that says, hey, I want to do something great for God. I want to do something more for the Lord. And God wants to use each and every one of you. The truth of the matter is this. God uses people. He just does. When you think about your life, if you are saved and on your way to heaven, God used someone to reach you. You say, well, I prayed a prayer by myself. Well, so someone somewhere talked to you and even gave you the knowledge to know to pray a prayer or to, say, to ask the Lord to save you. But God uses people. It might have been a mom. It might have been a dad. It might have been a pastor. It might have been a grandma. Hey, in my life, God used several people, grandparents praying for me, Sunday school teachers teaching me, all these people. God uses people. And the convicting thought that I have is God using me? My grandparents prayed for me. Do I pray for anybody? Am I, am I praying for my kids that they'll get saved? Hey, I had Sunday school teachers teaching me. 
Am I teaching anybody? You say, well, that's not really. No, no. Think about who God used in your life. Where would you be if it weren't for those people? Some of you wouldn't be here. Hey, I don't think most of us would be here. But God uses people. You might be sitting out there and say, God, God might use people, but he can't use me. Hey, God wants to use you. It doesn't matter where you come from, what you've done. God wants to use you. Hey, so the, the, the person out there who's thinking, God can't use me, you're the one he wants to use because he'll get the glory. God doesn't, he's not looking for the talented. He's not looking for the ones who, who everyone thinks he's going to use that. He's looking for the one who will just say, God, I'm not much, but I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll, I'll go wherever you want me to go. Hey, in college, and I shouldn't say this, and I say it sometimes, but I shouldn't. I literally skipped speech class every time I was supposed to give a speech. I realized that if I aced all the tests, I could make a B in speech without ever giving a speech. So I did. I, I literally, no call, no showed every time I was supposed to give a speech. Why? Because I was terrified of people. I didn't want to be up here. This is the last place <laughs> that I, this is not my comfort zone. I can talk to any of you one-on-one, -on -one and I'm fine. Up here, it's like, uh, I say stuff I shouldn't say. I do think, it's just, it's not what I love to do. But if God can use me, a shy, red-headed guy who did not like speaking, he can use you, and he wants to use you. You say, H how? Just avail yourself. Just say, hey, God, put me in the game. Yeah. Hey, pastor, I'll help vacuum. I'll help do whatever. You, what, what do you need me to do? Hey. That's something that's not asked a lot to pastors. Yeah. What, what do you need me to do? Yeah. A lot of times people want to do stuff that others can see them. Yeah. You need me to sing? You need me to usher? No, no, no. There's a lot more that goes into this. We don't know. I don't even know what all went in to this morning. We just show up and sit down. And everything, yeah. hey, there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears over the years that, that the Lord has used. Listen, people, this building's not here because of Brother Brooks. This building's here because of God Amen. and the work that God's done through him. Amen. God wants to use you too. Right. You're a light. But I feel like a lot of us are hiding that light. And not only the power of the light and the hiding of the light, but lastly, the purpose of the light. Verse number 16 in Matthew, I lost my spot again, Matthew 5, verse number 16. It says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What's the purpose of the light? Where people can say, man, you should, that, that guy sure is a great Christian. That lady, man, she's, she sure is godly. No. Because then it would become about us. But it's not about us. Listen, it says that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The purpose of light is not to glorify itself. The purpose of light is to illuminate Christ and glorify the Father in heaven. Listen, I'm not telling you to be a light in this dark world because you can get a pat on the back or you can invite people. I'm telling you to be a light in this dark world because God wants to use you. Think about it. Has our world ever been in a darker place than it is right now in our lifetimes? You say, well, we just had a Republican president. <laughs> is our country better off spiritually than where we were four years ago? No. No. Because... Help's not coming from the White House. Help's coming from God. And God uses people. I remember as a 15-year-old as a boy, growing up in a pastor's home, there was a lot of times where I would be doing things because I was, they were expected of me. And I remember we used to go out knocking on doors and invite people to church every Tuesday. And the only problem with that was I loved basketball and my brother loved basketball, and every Tuesday they played basketball at First United Methodist Church in El Dorado. So me and my brother would go, we would take clothes. Sometimes we might go, like, leave a few things on doors where we weren't lying for our parent, to our parents. Most of the time, though, we'd go, we'd take our clothes, we'd change, we'd play basketball. We would never pass out a track, we would never, nothing. You say, you're the pastor's kid, you really did that? Yes, absolutely did. What they say about pastor's kids is, is sometimes true. 
And so, not all the time. I, I was about to say it's always true, and then I'm like, he seems like a great guy. It's probably not true in his sake. But with me, I was supposed to be out inviting people to church, and I, I, I'd go play basketball every single week. Well, this one particular week, um, I remember a guy by the name of Chris Wright showed up. And Chris was the same age as me. He was one month younger than me. And the second he walked in the door, I thought, oh, Chris, what are you doing here? And I was mad because I knew my dad would say, oh, Jake will go with Chris. And I wouldn't be able to play basketball. He was ruining my plans. And sure enough, my dad said, Jake, Chris, y'all can partner up. And I thought, oh, Chris, I hate you. Why are you here? Just stay home. And I was angry. I was angry. And so I remember we go to knock on doors, and we get to the first apartment building, and as we're walking up to it, I'm like, Chris, I'm not talking to you tonight. You are. And he's like, uh, okay, I'll talk. And so we knock on the whole first building, and it was just one of those nights that no one was really interested. Everyone either had a church. They just they didn't want what we were passing out or what we were off. No one. Get to the second building, same thing. Last door of the second building, and the lady slams the door in our face. And so we're walking to the third building, and, and Chris says, I'm not talking anymore. You are. And I'm like, nope. We already made that agreement before this night started. I'm not talking today. It's all you. And he said, okay. He gets up to the door, and he knocks on it like the police, like harder than he, uh, uh, you would ever do that. And he just, like, beat on the door. And then he took, like, five steps back. And I'm like, what are you doing? The door starts to open, and I'm, like, I'm nervous. And I'm like, they're going to open the door with a gun and shoot me. He's, like, way back here. The door opens. It's this big, tall guy, jet black hair, buff. And I'm like, uh, um, uh, my, 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 name, my name's Jake. This is Chris back here. We're, we're, we're from, from, from Bible Baptist Church, and we're just out inviting people to church. And he said, man, I've been looking for a church. I was like, really? Uh, <laughs> you, the last three buildings, no one had that. He's like, yeah, I've been looking for a church. He said, actually, a lady at my work gave me a Bible this week. He went and grabbed the Bible. And me being a 15-year-old boy, I thought, wow, that, what a coincidence. And he, he brought me, he, he brought this Bible in, and he was like, yeah, this lady gave me this Bible this, this week. And I thought, wow, that's incredible. And, and he said, I'm going to come. And I thought, okay, great. And, and sure enough, he said, I'm coming this week. And I thought, I've never had an adult visitor at church. I was excited. And I, I, th I thought, this is going to be the week that I have an adult visitor. So I'm sitting out there looking out the back window, seeing if my adult visitor arrives. Doesn't show up. And I thought, oh, man, something must have happened. Adults don't lie to kids, so, so that must, obviously, he, he, something happened. He, he'll be back. So the next week, Tuesday hit, I didn't even care about basketball. I was like, we got to go check on this guy, see if he's going to come. And, and, and sure enough, we went by, knocked on the door, no answer. Next week went by, knocked on the door, no answer. Next week, that third week, we went by, knocked on the door, and he had forgot it was Tuesday. He answered the door and said, man, I've been lying to you guys. I'm going to come this week. Our, our tracks that we had been leaving, he was using them as coasters on his table for beer. And he was, he was just in a lot of stuff at that time. Hey, that Sunday, I, I remember waiting out the back door and, and just watching, and, and his silver Camaro pulled in the parking lot. Walked in the back door, sat on this, the back row over here on this side. My dad preached out Psalm 23. And afterwards, he asked if, if you knew for sure you were going to heaven. My hand went up. His hand didn't go up. He asked if, if you didn't know for sure. He raised his hand. I thought, man, he doesn't know for sure he's going to heaven. So I remember, what, what do I do? I never went to the altar, ever. And I thought, well, I better go just in case. So I remember the invitation started. I took off. He followed right behind me and, and came out. And I thought, man. What's going to happen? My Uncle Bob led him to the Lord. Listen, as a 15-year-old boy, I wasn't some spiritual person. I stuttered and stammered through, I, 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 I'm from Bible Baptist Church. Would you please come to church with me? That was it. I didn't know that that lady had given him a Bible at work and that the Lord had already begun doing a work in his heart before I even got there to that door that day. Hey, I didn't know that he was going to come to church and get saved. I didn't know that he was going to go to Bible college and, and marry his wife. I didn't know that he, the Lord would call him to the inner city of Philadelphia. Y'all supported him for, for multiple years. He, he started two churches in Kensington, Pennsylvania, the largest outdoor drug market in, Pencil, in, in, in America. I didn't know that. Hey, I wonder... I wonder how many times in my life 
that the Lord said, hey, invite that person to church. And I'd be like, no, I'm too busy. No, I don't feel like it. No, I want to play basketball. We don't know what God's already doing in someone's life. We don't know what God wants to do through us. But the question is, how bright is my life? You see, God uses people, period. But my question this morning is, are you allowing God to use you? But I, 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 there, there's no excuses. We're in the fourth quarter. Hey, he's coming soon. I don't want to be on the sidelines. I don't want to be on the bench. There's something inside of me that wants to do something for him. And I hope this morning someone out there would say, hey, God, put me in the game. My life hasn't been as bright as it should be. I want to do something for you. The darker the night, the brighter the light. As Christians, we're the light of the world. But how bright is your light? Every head bowed, every eye closed.